Thank you, Dave Gall. That was really fascinating and intriguing. I, I'm curious to hear more about the 70s, 80s, and 90s, <laughs> perhaps during, during the conversation. Hour, you would. <laughs> okay. We can't stop them. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nathan Funk, and I teach Peace and Conflict Studies at Conrad Grable University College. And both of those connections allow you to anticipate a consider to a considerable degree where, where I'm going to go and, and, and how I'm going to approach this topic. As you know, uh, Peace and Conflict Studies, it's an interdisciplinary field of study, and it's value explicit. And uh, we study root sources of conflict and violence. We try to understand uh, why some conflicts become destructive, and we're hoping to find ways in which human beings might deal with their differences with less recourse to warfare and organized violence. So when we study war, we're more inclined to ask, what went wrong? Or how might this have been prevented? Uh, what might we do in the future to ensure that this doesn't repeat itself than to ask questions like, what national or historical purpose did this serve? Also, if you know a thing or two about Conrad Grable University College, you know it's a Mennonite institution. And so as you can guess, uh, Remembrance Day is a day where, you know, for people in whose circles I move, Remembrance Day is a day that creates a bit of emotional complexity. Uh, from the start, though, I'd like to be just very clear in affirming that I can appreciate why, for, for many Canadians, doing Remembrance Day right with the red poppy and proper observances is very important. Uh, there are reasons why Canadians, like people of other nations, take time to remember those who fought in wars. And we're confronting here deep, irreplaceable losses. Uh, for veterans and non-veterans alike, we're also encountering indelible memories, life-altering experiences, the most you know, potent uh, time in a person's life, memories that don't disappear when the fighting stops. And we also just encounter powerful stories. And I, one story that I'm going to remember from this Remembrance Day, I encountered on the front page of the Toronto Star just a couple of days ago, the story of uh, a man by the name of Donald Stewart. Maybe some of you read it. The title of the story was You're Supposed to Be Dead. He was a man from Copper uh, Mountain, British Columbia. He had two brothers who died in the Dieppe Raid in France. And he was on a ship that went down in the Mediterranean about a year later. And there was another Donald Stewart on the same boat. So his parents received word that he had died. And I don't know why he never wrote back home after that, your mom and dad, right? but he didn't. And then a little over two years later, he showed up at home again, got off the bus, and his dad's a police officer, was there at the bus station, saw him step off the bus and said, you're supposed to be dead. Right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> According to this individual who told the story, that, that he said that uh, it was the only time I ever saw my father cry. And he, he and his father went straight home without calling, and his mother wouldn't let go of him for five minutes. So, and there's amazing stories, and, and we have to do justice to them, to acknowledge them, uh, resonate with them. Uh, now, in answer to one of the questions posed for this event, you know, does, does Remember Stay exclude or include anyone? I, I feel as it, one, one of my roles tonight is to highlight the point that you know, not everyone experiences Remembrance Day in exactly that way or in the same way. And for, you know, I, know, I noticed, for example, reading, uh, I was reading the community editorial board uh, page in the, the Waterloo Region record a couple days ago. Uh, and I was just looking at the different stories, told you know, how will you remember, remember Remembrance Day and what does it mean to you? And there are about maybe, maybe almost 20 different perspectives. And one pattern I noticed is that some of the, the newer Canadians had slightly different uh, statements than, than some of those Canadians which fit our sort of stereotype of the established uh, multi-generation Canadians. Uh, there was a, a young woman by the name of Jenny, Jenny Fawn who, uh, rather than talking about painful overseas wars during the 20th century, uh, she took a, went into less, what, well it seems that she viewed that framing of the, the day as less intuitive than a general observation that war is harmful to all people. So she stated that, I will be remembering not only the soldiers of past wars, but the soldiers and citizens surviving their own civil wars today. There is far too much unfathomable fathomable suffering going on in the world right now, and it would be irresponsible to ever try to forget. Another young woman, Alana Rangaswamy, sounded a similar note. This year I display the scarlet adornment in solidarity with all people united through loss and with renewed appreciation of the blessings I have. Uh, now, uh, if you spend a little time uh, with, in the Mennonite community this time of year, 
You'll certainly hear some war stories uh, about the major 20th century European armed conflicts, the usual conflicts, but they're not the usual kind of stories. Uh, many of these stories are marked by trauma, by threatened values, danger, and struggle. Uh, during a lunchtime conversation last week, I found myself sitting at a table with two people of Russian Mennonite heritage, both of whom had pacifist grandfathers who'd been forcibly conscripted by the advancing German army on the Eastern Front. And they were st faced a very stark choice, join or else. Uh, as one of my colleagues put it, in grade school, it was terrible. Here we were hearing about how grandparents of many other kids had fought a noble war to liberate all of Europe. And my opa, he'd been forced to serve the evil Nazi regime. The other side, what could I say? I just wanted to hide. Other Mennonites were conscripted by Stalin, by the other side. Uh, and many losses, as there were for all European civilian populations living in the midst of the theater of battle, for whom the two world wars were not overseas events, as it were Tend to tend to remember them here in, in Canada. Uh, for those fortunate enough to be in North America already from the Mennonite community, things went better, but strong social pressures remained. The notion, notion of conscientious objection was still a novelty during the first half of the 20th century. And being a pacifist, even a useful pacifist who showed up willing to lend a hand and pitch in for the war effort, was often subject to insults that called masculinity, patriotism, patriotism, and even basic human decency into question. Being German didn't help either, and was experienced as a very real liability for many people in this region, not just the Mennonites. Otherwise, we'd be living in the Berlin-Waterloo region. And, you know, the, we all know the story about changing from Berlin to Kitchener. The mood was dour enough to raise fears among many of losing jobs, land titles, or even voting rights. So that these were ideas that appeared to be circulating made people very nervous. Uh, during the Second World War, you know, many pacifists, not just Mennonites, but also Quakers, Seventh-day Adventists, and others, uh, sought to engage in alternative forms of service, meeting social and economic needs on the home front. Those are their war stories, being involved in agriculture, industry, logging, food processing, construction, and mining. The resultant experiences of, in many cases, getting off the farm and chipping in uh, without generally engaging in conflict, though some did enlist, uh, provided an impetus for thinking about post-war forms of voluntary service and engagement with relief after the war. Many went to England and elsewhere in Europe and were participating in post-war release efforts. And then later, this part becomes part of a tradition of thinking about proactive engagement with relief, development, and, and peacemaking work in the world, trying to be proactive in getting at underlying sources of war and armed conflict. Now, it, personally, you know, as, as a human being who's been blessed with the good fortune of just studying wars and, and not having to fight them, I understand the desire of many to have Remembrance Day serve exclusively as a day for telling stories by and about soldiers and veterans. Canada, like most countries, tends to pay attention to soldiers returning to foreign wars for a finite time and has a limited attention span for people who have been, quote unquote, there and back again and who have seen everything change as a consequence. You know, still, as an academic working in peace and conflict studies, and who, who thinks about uh, narratives in conflict, the stories we tell, national narratives, the narratives. I, I, there are people in my field who study you know, ethnic conflict and nationalist conflict. They're always looking at the narrative. And when we see that there's just one story, we get worried. If, if there's just one dominant story and, and there's not dialogue or uh, acceptance of, of other possible narratives, that's when we worry that we're foreclosing our options. We're likely to see worse scenarios in the future. But, but going back then, I, I find myself asking, is there a way in, of including consciously other stories in addition, not negating, to, um, in addition to soldier stories in our Remembrance Day remembering, in our accounting for the realities of war and of the ways of responding to armed conflict? Our alternative ways of marking Remembrance Day for example, the white poppy, the white poppy debate. Are these misguided? That's one of the words used in the, the Waterloo Region Record editorial uh, recently. Uh, the Globe and Mail smacked it down today. Uh, so is, is that misguided and disrespectful? Or is this one of various ways of remembering and responding to war and engaging in contemporary dates about national identity and purpose? Can we blend 
firsthand narratives of overseas wars coming from soldiers uh, with historical inquiries that probe the tragically high costs and moral messiness of war or the questionable calls of decision makers. Personally, I sometimes wonder if our strong public emphasis on heroic experiences in war, and there is heroism, there are obviously acts of great bravery, sacrifice, I wonder if this emphasis is at least partially based on guilty recognition that too many veterans don't get what they need after coming home. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but notice the Doug Saunders column, November 9th, on Saturday in the Globe and Mail, where he offers his usual contrarian take, uh, uh, arguing that much public rhetoric is inconsistent with the way veterans are actually treated. And arguably that rhetoric can even serve to deflect from pressing substantive needs of those who have served overseas. And I'll quote him, he says, in a heartless move, the Veterans Affairs Department decided to eliminate the disability pension for wounded and traumatized veterans, replacing it with a lump sum payment that many consider paltry. It closed departmental offices and veterans hospitals and, and so forth. So it's just, just call, calling for us to, to look at some of these substantive issues in relation to also our, our thinking about the quality of our remembrance. There is a lot I could say about Remembrance Day that would reflect my own fields and my own deep ambivalence about nationalism. Uh, arguably one of the more profound causes or of reasons for World War I. It's hard for me to focus on what's unique about Remembrance Day in Canada because I keep sliding back into comparisons with rights of remembrance in other lands where the goals and stories tend to be very similar, similar in many respects to, to what we hear at home. Loss in war, the remembrance of heroes and the aspiration to forge a cohesive national narrative about wartime experiences, these things are universal. They happen in many different countries. Uh, we encounter them, sadly, in one part of the world after another. And though seemingly worlds apart, the Canadian parent who dons a red poppy in memory of the courageous son he lost in Afghanistan shares much in common with a father I met in Iran a few years ago in the city of Hamadan at a cemetery to which he had brought rose petals for the grave of the young son he had lost to the war with Iraq what he and most other Iranians saw as a very much defensive war. His son's decision to volunteer, he tearfully recollected, was one that he had affirmed and supported. Yeah. This universality of Remembrance Day is always on my mind at this time of year and is a principal reason for my single reservation about John McRae's poem, stanza three, line one. Uh, the first two stanzas are profound, uh, and the rest of the stanza three about receiving the torch, that's unobjectionable, depending, you know, we can interpret that in various ways, how we stand up, make meaning from the losses, but that part about t the quarrel with the foe and uh, following the same, all the same response to the opposition, that, that, that's something that I think would be worthwhile discussing. Uh, so my short answer to the question posed for this event, you know, is Remembrance Day still relevant, it is sure, of course, yeah, obviously. Let us remember in ways that are inclusive and forward-looking, as well as retrospective, and that give scope to familiar as well as unfamiliar voices. Let us also remember the original context of Armistice Day. Yeah. And here I may be just a little out of my depth, not being a, a histor military historian, but my un understanding is that World War I was still a very fresh memory when this holiday was first declared, and that the devastation it had brought was deeply visceral. So while surely honoring soldiers and commemorating military losses was at the core of it, there was also a very strong desire that history not repeat itself. Given our own comparative well-being today, there would seem to be no good reason why we cannot look back on the century that brought us total war. And I think if we're not remembering the 20th century brought us total war, uh, we're not remembering well. Uh, but can we look back on that century in a way that helps us discern, you know, reasons why war became so all-encompassing and devastating and rededicate ourselves to building a world in which there are better means for addressing grievances short of war. So let's consider the lessons of modern human rights movements, the human rights movement itself receiving impetus after World War II, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, one of the outcomes of that, that struggle. And let's also consider the lessons of nonviolent conflict. 20th century was the, the century of total war, but it was also the century where you know, nonviolent action, mass nonviolent movements for democracy, for change, for civil rights also became very much more sophisticated than in the past. So, uh, you know, like Romeo Dallaire, uh, whose memories of war drove him to campaign for, against the practice of using child soldiers to pull young people out of wars, uh, 
Let's reflect on ways in which remembering, remembering well and in detail with openness to the experience of others and other nations can inspire us to work together for peace.